When I say the word jazz, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Maybe you think of Miles Davis or John Coltrane. Maybe you think, ugh, boring elevator music. Maybe you think of the B movie. I say something. You like jazz? <gasps> but when you first think of jazz, one thing that I'm sure doesn't immediately come to mind is Nazi Germany. In the 1920s, American jazz and swing music took the world by storm, quickly becoming an international phenomenon. Germany was no exception to this and was overtaken by the popularity of jazz and swing. However, things would take a turn when the Nazis seized power in 1933. The Nazis began a campaign of censorship against any and all art, music, books, and cultural elements that were at odds with Nazi ideology. Jazz and swing music fell victim to this campaign as it was deemed to be degenerate music full of black, Jewish, and anti-German influence. Many establishments and local leaders in Germany issued public decrees prohibiting jazz and swing music. However, jazz was never fully outright banned in Nazi Germany. But if the Nazis thought that jazz was so awful and corrupting, why didn't they ever enact a national ban and just get rid of it completely? Well, the reason for this is a bit twofold. For one, jazz and swing was immensely popular with the German public. It's hard for us to imagine this in today's world, but in the early 1900s, jazz and swing music was the epitome of cool. Jazz was so cool and beloved that it even spawned its own counterculture movement of teenagers in Nazi Germany who defied the government and rejected Nazi ideals by embracing jazz music and English culture. They were commonly referred to as the Swing Jungen, or literally the Swing Kids, and they were known for organizing jazz dance festivals which were often used as a platform to mock the Nazi regime and their authoritarian ideology. They were well known to mock the infamous Sig Heil chant with Swing Heil. Sig Heil! Sig Heil! Sig Heil! Sig Heil! Sig Heil! Sig Heil, boy! I'm from South Germany! While the Swing Jungen used jazz as a means to protest against the Nazis, they were far from the only group of Germans during the war to have a love of jazz. Many German soldiers were well documented to enjoy jazz and swing music, but especially notorious for this were the German Luftwaffe pilots. The German Luftwaffe pilots were well known to frequently tune in to the BBC so they could listen to the American style swing they longed for. And this was a problem for the Nazis because many Luftwaffe pilots had much closer contact with the enemy and many could also speak English. And this made these pilots especially susceptible to anti-German propaganda being espoused on BBC jazz broadcasts. And this problem led the Nazis to create their own orchestra that would play jazz music. The orchestra was named the DTU, which stood for... Okay, yeah, I'm not going to butcher that pronunciation. But it translates to the German Dance and Entertainment Orchestra. The DTU's goal was to provide quality German entertainment for German soldiers and boost their morale while simultaneously keeping them from tuning in to enemy broadcasts. Despite the Nazis' view of jazz being degenerate music, they were quick to recognize the powerful effects jazz and swing had on people, including on German soldiers and citizens. Which leads us to the second reason that Nazi Germany never fully banned jazz. They wanted to use it as a weapon. World War II was the first major global conflict in which the radio played a significant role. Radio broadcasts were utilized for far more than just entertainment and information. Radio was used to build and break morale, inform and deceive, and amuse and even intimidate its listeners. And the international popularity of jazz and swing was essential to radio propaganda used during the war by both the Allied and Axis powers. In Nazi Germany, Joseph Goebbels, head of the Nazi propaganda ministry, understood the limitless potentials that radio carried. Goebbels created a radio campaign in 1940 aimed at the English-speaking public called Germany Calling, 
which was hosted by William Joyce, who used the pseudonym Lord Haw Haw. The program was a mix of news, music, and comedy sketches, and was quite popular in Britain, as Joyce would read letters from British POWs held in German camps. Between the news and comedy sections of the show, jazz music was frequently played. The jazz heard on Germany Calling was performed by a band called Charlie and His Orchestra. Charlie and His Orchestra was a German orchestra previously named the Lutz Templin Orchestra, who was approached directly by Joseph Goebbels and contracted for the specific purpose of playing jazz. The orchestra added Karl Schwedler, aka Charlie, at the helm on vocals and was soon after heard all across British airwaves. Charlie and his orchestra would draw in their listening audience by playing popular and familiar jazz tunes. They would start the tune and Charlie would usually sing the first verses or so in their original form before bursting into rewritten propaganda or parody lyrics, which were often written by Carl himself. I'm putting all my eggs in one basket I'm betting everything I've got on you I'm giving all my love to one baby Lord help me if my baby don't come true I've got a great big amount Saved up in my love account Honey and I've decided love Divided in two won't do So I'm putting all my eggs in one basket I'm betting everything I've got on you Here is Mr. Churchill's latest song to the Americans I'm putting all my eggs in one basket I'm betting everything I've got on you I'm giving my British Empire to you, Yankee. Lord help me if my victory won't come true. I've spent a great big amount. Gone is my lovely bank account. Yankee, I've decided your dollars must be divided in two, or I'm through. So I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. I'm betting everything I've got on you. These songs are certainly strange when you hear them, and they do seem rather ridiculous to us now, but Joseph Goebbels hoped that these jazz renditions would break the morale and spirit of the British people and remind them of their constant misery due to German bombings. He hoped this would make the British people see Churchill as the true enemy and turn against his administration. Although the Nazis first targeted Great Britain with their propaganda jazz campaign, the Brits were certainly not the only allied nation to face this style of psychological warfare. In early 1942, after Germany formally declared war on the U.S., Joseph Goebbels oversaw a similar jazz propaganda project aimed at the Americans called Station to Bunk. Station to Bunk was first broadcast to U.S. airwaves in March 1942 and was quite similar to Germany Calling as it was a mix of news, comedy, and jazz. Station to Bunk claimed to be a broadcast from the U.S. and a voice of reason debunking all of the wartime lies that Americans were being told by their government. The Nazis aimed for the program to appeal to Midwestern and rural Americans and hoped to create a rift between rural Americans and the government in Washington. Station Debunk used jazz in its broadcast to try to lure in potential listeners. However, the use of jazz simply wasn't a major appeal to Midwestern Americans at the time. Many Midwesterners had a desire to listen to polka and bohemian music and even the Midwesterners who did want to listen to jazz were largely unimpressed with the selection of outdated songs played on Station Debunk. Debunk was also outdated in its use of American isolationist rhetoric on the program. It was 1942 when Debunk was being aired in the U.S. Only months prior, Pearl Harbor had been bombed by the Japanese and Germany had formally declared war on the U.S. The isolationist message was simply too late and the sleeping giant was now awake. 
The Nazis made many miscalculations in their attempt to propagandize the U.S. through Station to Bunk, leading to it mostly being regarded as a failure. And not only this, but Debunk was painfully obvious to be blatant Nazi propaganda and was quickly identified by the Chicago Sunday Tribune as a Nazi phony broadcast coming out of Berlin, not actually the voice of an American patriot dissident like it claimed to be. Debunk often tried to camouflage its ties to the Nazi government by starting the program off with the Star Spangled Banner. Hello everybody, this is Station Debunk, the station that debunks war propaganda, war hysteria, war profiteers, and war criminals. We are on the air every night at 8.30 p.m. Central War Time, operating on 7.2 megacycles. We'll start our program in about one minute. I say, can you see? I say, can you see? I, I say... As the war progressed on, the Nazis continued their propaganda campaigns, but after the German defeat at the Battle of Stalingrad on February 2, 1943, and Joseph Goebbels' subsequent proclamation of total war, most German jazz bands and venues that previously slid by and coexisted with Nazi ideals were stomped out for the duration of the war. The influence of jazz in World War II is often overlooked when we think back nowadays, but its massive influence on the war can't be forgotten. Jazz was used for entertainment, as a form of protest, and as a means of propaganda by both the Axis and Allies. Although jazz and swing music were seen to be degenerate in the eyes of the Nazi party, it was simply inescapable. Jazz was cool and fun, and its international popularity was unmatched. Even under the oppressive authoritarian Nazi regime, jazz was able to creep through and survive, whether it was being played as Nazi propaganda or in a protest against Nazism, jazz music was still being played. While there were many political, cultural, and personal divides between the Allied and Axis forces, one thing uniting them all was the sound of jazz. Mm -hmm. 